right, everyone. Thank you for tuning into the Honest Defense podcast. Today, I am honored to be joined by Wayne Fetterman. Wayne is a stand-up comic, actor, producer, uh, comedy historian, writer, and least impressively, a USC professor. He has been in about 90% of my favorite comedies. I mean, 40-Year-Old Virgin, Step Brothers, Curb Your Enthusiasm, The League, Community, Always Sunny, 50 First Dates, Knocked Up, Crashing, Silicon Valley, and even Legally Blonde, which inspired me to go to law school. I thought that I would be the next L. Woods, but the Harvard Admissions Committee was not as impressed with my application. And he's the author of the excellent book, The History of Stand Up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. You can tell how much I like a book by how destroyed it gets when I'm reading it. I mean, this thing I, I carried around with me for the last couple of weeks everywhere. I was marking it up. I loved it. Uh, he's also a producer on the upcoming documentary, George Carlin's American Dream, which is coming out April 20th on HBO. Wayne, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Uh, quick question. Did you send a video to Harvard to get into their I, hospital? I, you know, I'm not as attractive as Elle Wood, so I figured that would actually knock me down a few pegs. So I didn't send a video. Maybe that was my problem. Maybe if you did a funny one. <laughs> I should have done that one. <laughs> I'm I'm happy. I'm happy with my path. I don't know how I would have done it. Harvard Where did you anyway. go to law school? I went to Notre Dame and then ah. got a master's at Duke. So yeah, what? not qu not quite hard. It's like that. Those are the schools that people go to when they can't get into the Ivy League. That's you really feel like Duke is a step down from Ivy League? Everyone I met at Duke, like Duke, Notre Dame was different. A lot of people went to Notre Dame because they grew up Notre Dame fans. Their parents mm -hmm. were Notre Dame fans. So Notre Dame's different. Duke, every single person at Duke was there because they didn't get into Harvard, Yale, Princeton. And it isn't it interesting because Duke has that reputation of being the school that the other kids in North Carolina hate because right. there's all these rich, smart kids are going there. Yep. It's interesting. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very self-hating population there. It's, yeah, it's Nixon went there, if I'm not mistaken. That's, he went, it, they have a portrait of Nixon, but it's like hidden in the corner of the library. So it's like for some reason, they don't want to get rid of it, but they also can't display it proudly. So that was right. always my study spot was right under Nixon. <laughs> he, he was my idol. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a comedy historian, but I also like, like presidents and stuff yeah. like that. Have you been to his museum or... Or, I I have not. Where is the Nixon Museum? Oh, it's where he grew up. It's in uh, how oh, it's uh, I can't remember. I want to say Whittier, but that might be wrong. Um, yeah, but it's in California. I thought right I thought next California. to the house he grew up in. It's really quite interesting, sad, and inspiring a bit. Yeah. There there was a great podcast. Did you listen to uh, Shane Gillis and Louis C.K. did a podcast series where they went through all of the presidents. It was this great, like it was a four part. I mean, I think it totaled like seven hours. They just put it out last week and they went oh, through really? all the presidents. And and Louis, Louis' favorite president was Nixon. I mean, he, he went into this whole thing about how growing up as a kid in Mexico, like he idolized Nixon and and he had this whole it. story about it. So that Nixon, for some reasons, uh, is popular among comics, I guess. That I mean, it's not that it's just I mean, I live in California right. and I went down there to to see it, but it was, yeah. I mean, I've been to Reagan's, I've been, to, yeah, I've been to a few, I've been to yeah. a few, but yeah, Nixon's obviously, I think he might be appealing. I'd like your thoughts on this because maybe he's, you know, it shows Shakespearean his rise yes. and fall, and it's self inflicted. Like yeah. the whole thing is just just terrible. He he was a he was. A, it just just as a person, as a character, he was fascinating. And I, I, I think probably a lot of comics see themselves in him. Just maybe, the, maybe. The the ebbs and, and the flows. All right, we're gonna just talk about Nick. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Have we can let, let's go comedy. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 that's uh, it. That's all right, it. all right. So, okay, so we'll we'll switch to comedy. I mean, Nixon was a comedy of errors, but we can we can talk about other comedies. So, talk <laughs> to me first about how you got into comedy. What what was kind of that initial interest? Um, I think, you know, it, I think there was a, a, a psychological thing of just liking attention because I came from a weird pay. I had, there were four kids in my family and then my dad died. And then how old were years, you? Several years, like one, I never oh, knew okay. him. I've only seen photos of him. And then, so for a long time when my mom was trying to recover from all of that, I, I, whenever I would go to family events, I was always entertaining, trying to get attention, trying to get something, you know, and then later my mom remarried and had two other kids. So I, so then I'm no longer the youngest, but I was already six. I had already, so there was that. And I don't know if you know this, a lot of comics tend to be the youngest in the family. It's uh, not all, not all. I just saw, I just saw John Mulaney and he's, I think a middle kid for some reason. And so anyway, so I think that's how the start of like, oh, I like being on stage. I like attention. 
And then I just was always fun. I was just a funny kid. I was just, and I liked comedy. I, you know, comedy albums. And, and then when I realized it was an actual job, I was like, what? This is, <laughs> this is a job? Yeah, so. Was there a moment, do you remember that moment when you said, oh, I can do this as a job? Oh, well, you, did, you don't know, but you get some early, like I got some early, I, this is embarrassing, but I did ventriloquism in high school. Because I was maybe not confident enough to just try stand up, and so, and I had, and you wanted really... to get girls, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like I said, I, needless to say, graduated a virgin from high school, but, but I had like pretty good success doing ventriloquism. Like I performed at the senior prom, I did the talent shows, I won. There was something you're probably not old enough to know about. There was something called gong shows, which are kind of like little talent shows they would do around town. And if you won, and I always won, like, I, you know, over dancers and singers and all of that stuff. So so I was like, oh, I think I can maybe make something of this. And then I just was, went to NYU drama school, tried to be, wanted a two-track, wanted to be an actor, a co great comedian who could also act. That was, that was, everything was focused on those two goals. Were you so, doing, were you doing stand-up while you were in school? Mm -hmm. I did shows while I was at NYU. I have tapes of them and stuff. But uh, and then I was also starting to audition and do little open mics in Greenwich Village. And you know, eventually I was able to get into the comic strip and the improv and Catch a Rising Star as a stand-up. Not as a, at that point, I'd given up Buford. The whole dream was over for ventriloquism. So, so yeah. So it was. I would say there wasn't. That's a good question. Was there a moment? Ask the question again. Was there a moment? Was there realized... a moment when you realized you could do it as a career, or even just like just because I never thought com. Mm -hmm. I never thought I grew up in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania. Like no one was in showbiz of any kind when I was growing up. So so I loved comedy, but I never in my wildest dreams thought, oh, this is something that could be a job. So I, I I'm always curious the people who do go into it whether they there there was like some spark or, or some light well, bulb. There was, said, oh, I can you make know, money doing this. There was a couple things that I read and saw when I was a kid that made me think this could be a career path. One was this book, and I end up, I end up writing a book called The Last Laugh, which was the story of this stand-up comedian. It's written, came out in 74 or something like that. And that was the first book written about comedians. It was like, oh, there's a place in, they called The Improv in New York where you go, and there's a, another new place called Catch. And so it was sort of a roadmap for like, because when you would read about like the big comedians when I was a kid, like Milton Berle, like, and then I was in vaudeville and like, there was no vaudeville, right. but I was just like, like, where would you? And so I was like, oh, okay, okay. This is, this might be, so I read that book. And then I read this other book called The Great Comedians Talk About Comedy. And then I would just watch talk shows. And next thing you know, Freddie Prinze has his own sitcom. Freddie Prinze was 19 when he right. did The Tonight Show. You know, I was, whatever. 13 when I was 14 when I saw him. So it was like, it wasn't like that crazy a thing. And so it was, I don't know. Well, and you write it's about a good the question. It's a good you, question. You write about the, the Freddie Prince on the Tonight Show moment in yeah. the book as, as kind of like yeah. you kind of marked that as like a turning point for that, the, the 80s boom in stand up comedy. I totally do. Yeah. That's well, my thesis. I stand behind it and I've talked to another comic, a number of comics from that time about it because he, it was so dramatic so dramatic can you explain that because for people my age i mean freddie prince jr is more famous than freddie prince and course, so i think course. people don't even know really who he is or why he was so significant well what happened is there was a there was a convert there was like this gathering storm is the way i would describe it and in 1972 three events happened one this new club in new york opens up called catch a rising star that's the second comic so now there's like two comedy clubs these are you know when this the idea as you know from the book, is that a number of comics could be on the same show was kind of a revolutionary idea in the business. Because everyone thought like, oh, you can't follow another comedian with a comedian, that's stupid. Uh, but so Bud started that at the Improv and then Catch a Rising Star up. Then the comedy store in LA opens. And after some rough, a rough start, they kind of gain their footing. So now there's a huge club in Los Angeles with stand-ups and then Johnny Carson 
moves the Tonight Show from New York to L.A. So now L.A. becomes the epicenter. And the first big comic to break when with Johnny Carson in L.A. Uh, is this kid, Freddie Prince, who's 19 years old. Um, and it's not only that he has an incredible set. It's not only that Johnny Carson brings him over to the couch, which is an unexpected sort of platitude that some comics got. It's that Carson says, it's my greatest thrill to introduce, I'm paraphrasing, young comedians and watch them come out and do great. Because Carson was a comedian, and he was always trying to get, you know, like a great Ed Sullivan spot to launch his career. So from that moment on, there was an incredible migration to Los Angeles. And within five years of that, so it's a, that's December 73, by 77, there's already a road comedy club in Los Angeles. You know, like that's the start of this comedy boom. And all these comics, like you said in the book, you could you could tell me, you know, Letterman comes from Indiana. Leno comes from Boston. Shanley comes from uh, the, uh, Tucson. Robin Williams comes from San Francisco. <laughs> like Kinnison the story, and you know. Yeah, yeah. It's just it, like everyone's they like, converge, and so now you have two hubs, and then they start doing road. You know, making this road thing. Next thing you know, there's a you know a giggles in yeah. Cincinnati or something. Right. You know, and that was the start of the comedy boom. And in it, my opinion, in right. my opinion, other people think it's later than that, but I think it really like that was the, that was lighting the fuse, right? you know, that was lighting the fuse with Fred, cause Freddie Prince does the show for those who don't know, like you. And then within, you know, a year has million dollars worth of bookings and he has Richard Pryor's manager sign him and he has his own sitcom called Chico and the man. He plays Chico. He's the lead in Chico and the man. So. Right. It's pretty wild. And, and it, so then it was, it was a combination of the industry realizing, oh, we can make a lot of money off these comics. And then younger comics be like, oh, I can make a lot of money in Hollywood or just doing comedy. And so there was kind of the, just this convergence of industry and talent as well. Well, I think comedians always have been successful, you know, I mean, before Freddie Prinze and stuff. But I think this was like kind of the young comedians were like really, really taking off at this point. I have to go back to you b before we keep going on this history oh, because let's go. I, I think the pinnacle of, and I'm a little biased because this was my adolescence, but the pinnacle of comedic movies was the early 2000s. And you were in every single one of those movies. And so, so my my friends and I, we used to, there was a couple guys, there was you, you, Matt Walsh, a few others, but you, it was you and Matt Walsh that, that we used to play this game with mostly, was we would try to spot you in movies. So we'd be, you know, in, in Four Dome Version, there's Wayne Fetterman, like we, we, you know, when, when Paul Rudd was, was trying to sell you a TV or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we almost got in a fight in Step Brothers because you, you played the, uh, the blind neighbor in Step Brothers and you were kind of off in the distance. And I said, that's Wayne, that's Wayne. And my friend in the movie theater next to me was like, that's not him. That, and we were like getting into an argument in the middle of the movie theater, uh, arguing over whether you were. So we, used to, we, we were fans of you from the early days. How did you get started kind of in that, in that world, in the, in the movie world? Well, I had done – well, you know, I be, I came out to Los Angeles like everyone else as soon as I got my SAG card. That was my – I started my career in New York, worked in New York, learned how to become a stand-up in New York, and then moved to Los Angeles as soon as I got a SAG because I didn't want to be out there without at least some sort of validation. And and I started doing uh, commercials. I'm trying to – and then I just would audition. Like I got an agent, and every once in a while, something would come along that I would audition for in book, like, you know, Legally Blonde, or there was uh, – yeah, so just like little, but was may I was mainly doing TV stuff. I was mainly doing like uh, living single. I had a recurring role in that and L.A. Law. So my the Fetterman dream was coming true. I was like, I'm a, I, again. I don't know if I'm a great comedian, but I was a really good comedian that could also act. Like that was what I wanted to happen. And then I'm trying to think how I got um, forty year old virgin. Yeah, but I, here's the crazy thing. Like I had known Judd from the day I moved out to Los Angeles. I met him and he was still at USC at that time. So we became friends. We wrote together. We actually wrote a, a pilot together. And he was 
this really interesting kid because he was a funny comedian and but he he was booking already he was like if you knew him he had a club down in marina del rey that uh, that he booked and he booked me at usc so he always had his 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 like one foot into creating opportunities for people other than himself which in a way helped elevate himself as it was like smart okay. you know me i was just like i i just want to work so um so i knew him through all of that through stiller and um freaks and geeks yeah yeah freaks and geeks i went to the rap party to that but i was never on freaks and geeks and then i think it was when i got on uh Shan, excuse me, the X Files or something like that. That he was, he put, I think he put me in 40 year old virgin. Like, I'm trying to think. Um, yeah, was there something? I mean, did you know early on, like, oh, he's gonna go places because that I'm, I'm sure you know, you're around a hundred different guys, they're all kind of trying to do the same thing. Everyone has scripts they're trying to write, everyone has yeah, shows yeah, yeah. they're trying to produce. Good question, yeah, but yeah. Was there something about him that stood out, or was it just kind of like, oh, Judd's the one that that made it? No, I, I mean, he he was funny. He was right. funny, but he did have a, I feel like he had a, a bigger sense of a macro thing of show, yeah. macro view of show business that I didn't have. Like, I wouldn't even, in a million years, I wouldn't think of, you know, booking comedians. I, I wouldn't want to, I want to write jokes and be funny. Like, yeah. that's all. And audition and try to get on television to get insurance from SAG. Like, that was, it was like really simple. Yeah. And yeah, I just think he had a bigger ver view of it. And, you know, he tried to get on staff at the Simpsons. You know, he had a lot of failures early on in his career of like trying to get staffed up and things like that. And they didn't like his specs and, right. and well, all even of that. Freaks and Geese got canceled after what, one season or maybe or well, two seasons? Well, of course. I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, same with Ben Stiller's show. Yeah. Which is an incredible show, in right. my opinion. Right. So um, I don't know, but he just kind of, like he leaned into his comedy nerddom and neuroses and then hooked up with great people, like ho hooked up with Steve Carell. Like, I think we can do this as a movie. And just, I actually think his eye for talent is as important as his writing skills. Cause he just, I don't know, you know, I mean, if you look at the people in Freaks and Geeks, it's ridiculous, right? Right. Yeah, that that whole era, and this is <laughs> I, like I, I I try to ch check my bias on this to make sure because again I was I was in high school, middle school, college when these movies were coming out, so it was the prime yeah. time for me to enjoy that kind of right. stuff. But I ask like younger guys, you know, who are like college age now, who are now a decade younger than me. I say, mm -hmm. you know, we grew up watching Four Year Old Virgin and and Anchorman and and all and old school, all those movies. I said, what yeah. what are you guys into now? And they're like those same things you know they, they watch they watch what i watched growing up like so they don't have their next generation of of comedy movies that they're watching and so i, right. I i'm cur i'm curious if like do do you do you think that that was just a, a magical time that era like late 90s early 2000s or that something that happens every generation where there's, there's i think there's it's just, just something that happens i mean i will say that big comedy movies yeah might be gone just because they're hard to be you know, they're just you know, in the in the the current landscape, they're hard to make, and it's you know it's hard to do because they have to whatever you have to diverse and all of the you, there's like a number of hoops you have to drunk jump through in order to make a great comedy movie. Now that's uh, you know, that's why there's not that many, right? Uh, you know, they get released, but the stuff on television is just as good, in my opinion. So I don't know. That's a good. It might be the last gasp of the big comedy movies. Yeah, like those big Universal. Yeah, and and like old school and all those are just. And I'm a huge fan of The Hangover. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever seen that thing. Is of that course. too young for you? Is no, that that's too... that's right in my that's right in oh, my alley. Yeah, I feel like that movie. And I was just watching. You think uh, it's too young for me, but not too young for you? Is, are you no, no, trying no. To make me older. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I just meant to, I'm trying to get your era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about Bridesmaids? That's as good as I feel like yeah. anything that was from that era. Yeah. You disagree with that? Um, uh, again, maybe maybe that was a little late. That was like outside of my demographic. Mm -hmm. But I no, I agree. Just just objectively, it's yeah, it's a great movie. Yeah, I just, I, for comedy, it's incredible. Yeah. Like, yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, but even that, I mean, Bridesmaids now at this point is is almost a decade old, right? 
Oh yeah. I mean, oh, that's, of course, of course. that's, I, I, it kind of seems like that, like, like 2012, 2013 was kind of the last couple of, of big comedy movies. Yeah. I'm trying to, this is a good, I'm trying to think there's, uh, there's gotta be some other. And it's and, and, like, uh, and uh, it, there's still great comedy being made. Obviously I love stand up. I love, I mean, podcast. We'll, we'll, we can course, talk all about that, but there, yeah. there's something about this big hundred million dollar, however much, you know, these budgets were these, these huge comedy movies that was just fun that you, you don't, you can't recreate in any other any other way i know i know medium. i know maybe train wreck was maybe yeah. the last one of, yeah you know or i mean i really liked um uh what was the one with kamal that with the, the incredible the big sick yeah big sick big sick, yeah. big sick. yeah that's a really that good, good. i don't know i mean i who knows i mean i'm sure someone will figure some kid right. will figure it out and make a big comedy. but i know what you're talking about a big universal presents this right. big comedy right. yeah oh there's seth rogan there's right exactly you know, there's, right Super bad. Right. Yeah. Again, there's something fun about that, that you see them pop up. You saw, you know, Will Ferrell pop up in, in Wedding yes. Crash at the end. He made that cameo. Yes, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And again, yeah. We, we, I mean, I, I'm not joking. We played this game with you, and you you would have these little roles pop up everywhere, and, and we'd point you out. But it, that, there was something fun to that, that content. I mean, I guess, like, Marvel's doing that now, where, where different characters pop up in different movies. They're just oh, doing it in a different yeah. genre. Yeah. You know what movie, Just I'm just reminiscing that yeah. I love from that era, is uh, Adam McKay's Talladega Nights. Have yes. you ever seen that thing? Oh, of course. Oh, my yeah. God. Ricky Talk Bobby. about comedy. I, oh it, it was incredible. I mean, the, yeah. Uh, and, and then the one that I always think is underrated is Walk Hard with John C. Ryan. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think oh. that's a lot of people haven't seen that one. I'm like, if you like that era of comedies, I mean, that was just that was beyond a comedy. I mean, that was just a great yeah. film. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the songs are incredible in that. Yeah. So, so when you're talking about stand up specifically, mm -hmm. you know, like when you talk to a comic who who has some sort of appreciation for the history of stand up, yeah. you you kind of they kind of trace their origins back to Lenny Bruce. That's always kind of the the modern uh, beginning of stand up. If you ask a comic, but you kind I of I don't know if I first of all I don't know if I agree with that, but keep yeah. going. Keep no, 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 okay, okay. But because I was going to say in the book, you go back an extra hundred years because Lenny Bruce was like late fifties, <laughs> early sixties. And and you go back an extra hundred years, you know, into the eighteen hundreds. So I was curious, uh, the, why did you pick that starting point? Well, I because I tell you why. Because and every, I, 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 just in, to, a, in a weird way, what you're saying is like exactly right. Because whenever we read books of comedy, people are like, "Oh, there was no modern comedy before Lenny Bruce or Mort Saul." They would right. point to a lot of times, and I was like. Well, Bob Hope wasn't doing comedy like right. he's a huge, huge comedy stand-up comedy star, and then so I kept going back and back. I was like, oh, there was no real comedy, and other people even make it er later than Lenny Bruce. They go, it really wasn't until the seventies with Pryor. Pryor and George Carlin. I was like, well, that's ridiculous. Right. Like, so now you're going to ignore Lenny Bruce and Jonathan Winters. So people kept ignoring generations of comics for some, or would just dismiss them with a couple paragraphs of them because they didn't write their own. A lot of them didn't write their own material. So I was like, all right, let's go back. Let me go back. Let me find out the guy that Bob Hope saw. Right. Let me find out about him. And then I find out about Frank Fay and those other guys and Tinney and those other vaudeville monologists. And I was like, all right, let's, can we go back further than that? And in my opinion, if you define stand up as one person, one person, not a comedy stage with the expectation of getting laughs, then obviously what Mark Twain was doing in those humorous lectures and what, you know, would qualify for that. But, you know, to tell you the truth, there was there was comedians before even Artemis Ward. And, like, and I kind of start with that guy who were like in blackface doing minstrel stuff like I don't know what who those guys were, but right. they certainly were around back then. So, but I start with Ward because he's like very well. Career. His stand up is written out, or his monologues are written out, and he literally created something that had not been there before, which was the funny lecture in this Lyceum lecture movement circuit. So, and then Twain sees him and was like, holy shit, this is how you tell a joke. This is the funniest guy I ever saw. And, and Twain was a funny dude. So yeah. so he took it. And then and the next thing you know, there's vaudeville and all of that stuff. So uh, that's why. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think you even mentioned the book. Like there, um, there are probably cavemen sitting around the fire making fun of other what? cavemen for not – 
not getting a hunt that day. So it, well, you, you Eric, have to start you, somewhere. Eric, you certainly know about uh, court jesters. Right. You know, those guys. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Those guys did the, the, you know, so this is in the 15, 1600s, right? In the Renaissance. So they're performing for the king. And if he doesn't like them, they get beheaded. That's the right. first start of cancel culture right there. Right. You lose your head. Right. Talk about Mark Twain. Uh, Mark Twain, like you could read Mark Twain today and still still chuckle what he's writing. Like it's incredible how long he's lasted. When uh, a lot of comedy, I mean, you can you can see some specials that were ten years ago, and and it seems dated. The, and this might be like a horrible question. That you know, what why are some things funny, some things not funny? But do you have any insight into why? Like, how is Mark Twain able, able to hold up after 150 plus years? Well, I, that's totally subjective what you're yeah. saying, and I don't know if I agree with you that he holds up in the same way a John Mulaney special is funny to people or Ali Wong or, you know, Gerard Carmichael, but I think, I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's some truths that he kind of reveals about the human condition that repeat itself that people connect to, but I mean, a lot of his language, I feel, is a little tough to you know, penetrate. Right, right. I don't know. Do you read Twain all the time? Not all the time, but it's like I, I, I remember even reading like Huckleberry Finn in in high school or college, uh -huh. and just like just chuckling at, at the way he he put a sentence together. And and again, right, it's not the same as a stand up special, but right uh, to me, it's just it's amazing. Like there's there's some old you know Animal House from the seventies. Like I don't really watch any other movies from the seventies. I don't I don't think most comedy from the seventies would still be funny to me. But Animal really? House. Yeah. Pro, you know, Pryor's still funny, I guess, but uh, I can't. Outside of Pryor and Animal House, I can't think of anything from the seventies. You know, my dad's always trying to show me stuff, and and it, I'm always like that. Eh. But but those are the two things that really stand out. So that's well, this, I'm fascinated by what what stays and what doesn't. Well, I look to me, the rule is most of it doesn't stay. Yeah, it just that's just because comedy tends to reflect the current society in some way, either the language or what they're talking about, subject matter, any of that. So, so a lot of it is ephemeral. I right. hope I'm using the right word. No, that's so it's that, ephemeral. That, that, so that's, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. I mean, and that's why, you know, that's why a lot of people don't connect to Lenny Bruce anymore. Right. You know, but they might, there's a few Twain, I think Carlin, I just did a documentary about him. His stuff tends to get passed around mm -hmm. on the internet a little bit and like, Oh, this is still funny. And, but um, yeah, for the most part, stand up doesn't translate, and even comedy in general doesn't translate that well. It's interesting. You don't find any '70s comedies. Have you seen <sighs> and any of that stuff, I, like Meatballs? And oh, Meat stuff? was Meatballs '70s or '80s? I feel like Meatballs oh, was that later. Might be 80s. Yeah. That might be '80s. Yeah, '80s. Um, There's a lot of '80s that that I like, but mm -hmm. but. To go back to the seventies, maybe I haven't seen a. You know, I'm trying to think of what I've seen and didn't like. But I, I the only thing I, I think of is Animal House, and Animal House to me is still one of the funniest movies I've ever seen. Yeah. Oh, uh, by the way, there was. Uh, did you see a movie in 1974 called Blazing Saddles? Oh, uh, Blazing Saddles that, is good. That's true. That's a good one. Young Frankenstein, same year. By the way, they both came out in the same year. That was an incredible wow. year. And then would those Woody Allen movies, none of them. I, Woody resonate? Allen never did anything for me. That, Interesting. Yeah. And, okay. and and a lot of people my age, like we know Woody Allen has been like the stuff in the news, like all the, all the personal yeah, the stuff. Guy. Like, okay. right. So I, I don't, I'm sure there's, there's some people my age like Woody Allen, but for the most part, I, I don't think he's translated to, to my generation. Look, and I'm there's good. It's when you hear a young person go, "Oh, I don't know about old school." It's yeah. going to shock you, but that's right. what's going to happen. Right. Just so you know. Well, but that's again, but that's I like it. I, <laughs> I, it makes me feel good that I'm still cool, but also makes me sad a little bit when I hear about twenty year old guys who are still watching old school because I think like right, that's great. Right. That's great that you're still watching the stuff I loved, but but. I you don't have your own things and, and you know they, they have YouTube and I think that's where some of their the young believe me they haven't there's a lot of comedy <laughs> okay. they, a lot of comedy out they're there. just trying to make me feel better it might be that too <laughs> uh, one of the one of the things you write about that's always fascinated me is the Friars Club because yep. when I was growing up they you know they, they had the roast on Comedy Central they always called them the Friars Club roast and, at the and beginning I know, they did yep, yep right right and and I know it wasn't like they I think they just kind of leased the name like it wasn't really directly related to the Friars Club but then I remember like reading about the actual Friars Club like there was this this club of comics like they had they had a physical club where they'd hang out yep. can you tell me a little bit about the Friars Club and and kind of what happened to it 
Well, <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, the Friars Club goes back to the early part of the 1900s. And there was a number of fraternal, these were men-only organizations, show business organizations. The Friars was one. The Lambs were another. They And they raised money. They're like guys. They got together. They told dirty jokes. They raised money for charity. And, you know, it was like a, a club of a guys, of comedy guys, mainly. Although there was also like... Like uh, George M. Cohan, the, the the songwriter and producer, he was in the Friars Club. So it was more of a theatrical fraternity than just comedy, although they loved comedians. And so they would do these big benefits. They were called Friars Frolics, and they'd go all over the country, and they'd raise a lot of money. And they had, like, uh, headquarters in New York. You know, that was where all the vaudeville guys would, like— hang out when they weren't working. So there was nothing in Los Angeles at this point at the Friars Club. And then uh, they would do, they started doing testimonial dinners for people. And then they created something called the late night dirty stag dinner, which were these roasts where they would do a testimonial, but make fun of the guy and use curse words that you could never say in nightclub stages or in vaudeville. And those started maybe by the 50, late 50s, and so they became popular again. No, If I'm not mistaken, I think Phyllis Diller might be the first woman ever to be at one of those, and she had to pretend she was a guy to sneak <laughs> into one. It's, and, and so it was, uh, it was a big thing. It was like, and then they started getting people that weren't – this was the start of the downfall, if you ask me. To make money, they – started selling memberships to people who weren't in show business. So if you were a successful dentist on the Upper East Side, right. you could be in the Friars Club. And suddenly you're hanging out with Milton Berle and, you know, all of, the, all of these guys, Jackie Mason, and suddenly felt like you were part of it. So it kind of got watered down. And then they opened one up in L.A. And the L.A. one, there's, there's going to be a movie about it. They, <laughs> you know, they... There was, they had a gambling room where people could play poker, and um, they apparently there was, there was cheating going on. There were cameras in the ceilings and stuff, so <laughs> there was a whole investigation. That club closed, and I think the one in New York also closed. I'm not mistaken. I think it did, but it was a big, like, like for the Ed Sullivan generation of comics, it was a big uh, badge of honor to be part of it or, and to be successful enough to be able to afford it. It was like hundreds and hundreds of dollars a year uh, to, to be part of this fraternity. And, and, and that's how the friar, you know, the roast started. So right. and you, that, you met, that sounds boring the way I told it, but anyway, no, that's, no, that's it. no, it's well, cause, but I think a lot of people don't realize like there is, there's like a whole business and social aspect. Like you're not on all the time when you're a comedian, you're not being funny all the time. So I, I don't know. I think a lot of people, what I hear comics on podcasts say, Oh, let's not talk inside baseball so much. Cause that's boring to people. But I think people all actually right. love the inside. Baseball. Okay. Well, there was one thing because when I was coming up in the eighties and so like kind of comedy boom era, like the big comics, they, they really didn't want to hang out the Friars. They'd like go, they'd do a set of Catch a Rising Star and go to a place called the Green Kitchen and hang out there and talk to them. Like, we don't have yeah. to pay, you know, $1,200 a year to hang out with each other. Right. I don't want to hang out with Freddie Roman anyway and these older guys. Like, let's do our own thing. And so there, there was a whole generation of comics who were just like, Richard Pryor is not in the Friars Club. You right. know what I mean? It was just like they were, it was like a new way of looking at stand up was passed along. And so it eventually had to die out. I mean, there was a, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's way more to it, but that's basically it. Well, that's, I, I get it. It's something that happens every generation. Like, you know, the, the, the back table, the comedy seller got famous from, from yeah, Louis show. Exactly. Like that that was kind example. of their version of the Friars Perfect Club. Example. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned vaudeville a couple of times. I want to talk about that because I think a lot of people probably don't even know what vaudeville is. And you kind of trace the origins of stand up to, to vaudeville. Can you explain what vaudeville was and how comedy Vaudeville is incredible. It was a variety show, and there was variety shows before vaudeville, but they tended to be in uh, like saloons and in these taverns, and they were very rowdy. And a lot of people would throw stuff at the performers: vegetables, tomatoes. I think you've seen maybe yeah. something like that. And 
It was called Variety Performance, and it was really rough and tumble. And then there was this guy. There was a couple guys, but there was this guy in New York who was like, let's, and it was mainly guys who went to the show, let's do a variety show, but have it for the whole family. So women can go, gentlemen can go. It was called Polite Entertainment. So they, he and this guy in Boston, another guy in Boston, create kind of vaudeville, which is that same old variety show, but no hells, no dams. You couldn't say slob. Couldn't do any material that was bad. And then eventually they created this, and it was hugely successful. So now instead of just getting drunk guys at night, they could have matinees during the day, and women could come, and kids could come, and it was like family entertainment. So it it became huge and then corporatized across the United States. So there was these big circuits, the Orpheum circuit and the, you know, the Keith circuit. And they these and the comedians could get booked for an entire year, which was everything but the summer was a vaudeville. So it was basically Labor Day through Memorial Day. That so forty some weeks. And you could, you know, tour the country. And there was small time, which were like shitty theaters. And then there was big time with these incredible opulent theaters. And you do a couple shows a day and be a big shot, make a lot of money. And so that lasted from like 19, but late 1800s to about 1925. And then what happened was, Motion pictures came along and right. people just loved those things, especially when sound happens in 26, 27. So it gets killed by that. And then all of those acts from Vaudeville end up going to nightclubs, which is kind of a, was just sort of like what comedy clubs became. We, we became comedy clubs, but they were kind of these lush things, many of them run by the mob because they all served alcohol. And yeah, so these big nightclubs like the Copacabana, you can still, if you ever go to like Las Vegas and you go to see like, um, not the big arenas, but the smaller arenas, like in at Caesar's palace, you can see like, oh, this is what a nightclub looks like. You know, you like tip the maitre d' to sit down close to the thing. There's a guy coming around, he'll take your picture and you can pay for it. There's a cigarette girl. It was very... You know, it was expensive, not crazy expensive, but expensive, and it was nightlife. So that's what came out of Vaudeville. But I know I'm kind of di digressing. No, no. But Vaudeville was the big entertainment in the United States from like 19, I would say 1895 to 2000, to 1925. So it, was, it had a really good run. And here's the most important thing for stand ups. The biggest gig you could get would be play this one theater in New York called the Palace. And the Palace was where if you did great there, you were a made man. You could get booked years on different circuits and stuff. So if you were a comedian, that was your goal to play the Palace. And so. One of my favorite stories you, you talk about when you're oh. covering vaudeville is the small time clubs you would do these continuous shows oh, yeah. where it was like, I forget the hours, but it was like, they, they would start at 10 AM and go until like midnight and, and the shows would just run continuously and people kind of just come and go. Yep. And, and I guess, I guess people would have to, I, maybe they performed in shifts. I mean, were the people on stage that entire time? Well, it's a variety show. So you like, you do right. do your act and you know, you'd have to do it again in an hour and a half and then do it again in an hour and a half. And again, this was small time. And if you were in big time, you did two shows a day. So it was a whole, like, you know, uh, pecking order there right. where you would run into your vaudeville buddies and like, I, oh, I'm a big shot two show a day guy. And you're like, do, whatever, doing nine shows continuous or something. Yeah. Oh, good. I, you read the book. I love it. I actually I it. read it. That's yeah. Why don't you tell, why don't you say, tell about the blue material where that oh, came from? So, and I, a lot of people don't even know this term, people who aren't, aren't familiar with, you know, deeply with comedy. So there, there's the term yeah. called working blue, which means you're working dirty. You're using, you're using foul language. And so the, and I, I've, I've heard 
competing stories of this, but I think the, the most common story is what you include in the book, which is mm -hmm. in, in vaudeville, they were supposed to be these family shows. And if you had a, a comedian on there who'd said words he wasn't supposed to say, at the end of the show, someone, whoever was running the show, would hand him an, a blue envelope. And on the end, and in the card, in the envelope, was a list of all of the words that he said that he wasn't supposed to say. And then if you, know, if you did it again, if you use those words the next show, you'd get fired. Right. Did I, did I tell it well? Yeah. What were the other competing stories? Did they go back to English, England? I, I, I'm try I can't remember. It, it, it had something to do. I don't remember actually now the competing, the competing okay, stories. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah Cause I, somebody has told me this story. And it's like, I don't know if it quite, and I got that out of this book, this woman who was the secretary at the palace theater. She wrote a book. Oh God, what's her name? Judith. And then she wrote a book in the seventies about her experience when she was a kid not a kid, but a young woman working at the palace. And that's where that blue story comes from for okay. me. And I've heard a number of people say it. But I, again, this is nerd, 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 nerd. Apparently. Yeah, you're, you're, in, you're in a safe space for that. So don't worry. Apparently in England, there was like someone would put a blue pencil through stuff. There was like a, a, a sensor plays. Yeah, I, I think that's the other one. Supposedly, I heard. that's where the idea of it came before the blue envelope. Yeah. And then the, the origin of the term stand-up, too, has some competing uh, stories. But my favorite one, because I'm part Italian, is the one that it starts with the mafia, that the mafia, yeah, yeah, yeah. which yeah. owned the, the early clubs, also controlled boxing. And, and a boxer that they controlled who wouldn't fall uh, – tell me if I'm, if I'm telling this incorrectly. But no, I love it. A, and I, I'm sorry I'm telling your stories from your book. No, but... it's not my <laughs> – I didn't invent that story. Yeah. But a boxer who was controlled by the mafia who could stand up you know, for, for some punches, not just fall over right away, was called a stand-up guy. And then a guy in the mafia who they could trust was called a stand-up guy. And so they, that translated to the, the comedians. Stand-up stand comic, comic, yeah. But I've, I did a lot of research on, like, when it was printed, like in print first. And I found June 23rd, 1948 was the first time it was in Variety, which is like the show business like trade magazine, and to describe a comedian working here in Los Angeles. Why do you think you, – you mentioned how so many of the early stand-ups were, were Jewish, and I'm part Jewish, part Italian, and I think my Italian side is way funnier. And you know, you had, <laughs> you had at, at the same time, you had, you had you know, the, kind of the underclass were, were Jews, were Italian immigrants, were Irish immigrants. So uh, why do you think it was, it was the Jewish people that were so attracted to, to comedy and not some of these other lower class? It was. Groups? It was everybody. It was, you know, it was all of the – stand-up was totally our – they were called monologists before 1948, uh, were totally like part of the melting pot immigrant story. Like that was, but there was also like, uh, you know, like these old New Englander characters. Like, so they, they had that kind of thing too. And even Native American kind of like acts were going around back then, but mainly I don't know. I don't know why it was Jew, but there was, you know, there's a famous Italian comedian named Pat Cooper when I was a kid who like worked all the time and his, that was his whole shtick. And obviously, you know, numerous Irish comedians. I mean, Bob Hope is English. Right. You know, he was maybe the biggest com comedy stand up comic of that era of the, you know, mid century, no question, mid century modern. There's Bob Hope standing there. And, so it wasn't just com just Jewish comedians, but – and there was a famous Irish comedian on radio named Fred Allen who was incredible. So it's not – I think it's a little bit of a myth that it was just okay. a bunch of Jews running around doing stand-up. But there was, as a – as compared to a percentage of the population, uh, more. But don't forget, a lot of this kind of comes out of New York and Boston and stuff and Chicago. So there was big Jewish – people there you know settlements i guess you what do you I, go yeah, ahead go, go ahead. ahead no no go ahead no, i was, I was, gonna, I was gonna thinking, the subject no 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 i don't i mean i don't I, there's a number of theories that's like you know, you know jews were very you know they're into the written word they're into debating they're into thinking about things in different ways and that's sort of what comedy is is you look at a sign and you say, it says no swimming here, but it, you know, if you're Jewish and looking at it slightly different through a comedic lens you can go and say, oh, it says no swimming here. Right, right. Right, so it's as simple as that. Right. Like you just are, look. you're always looking at like a different meaning, a different angle 
And that's what a lot of stand up is. Right. That's true. Like the, the Italians are much better at the roast style where it's like sitting around a family dinner, just making fun of each other. And the, the right, Jews right. are more analytical. So that I think so. I, from I my know. own experience, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. If, if we can fun. stereotype, <laughs> you, you can't talk about American entertainment history without talking about uh, Hugh Hefner. So I, I love the story. And I, and you know, so many people think, you know, Hugh Hefner's seen as kind of this, this caricature of himself, but I even, I wrote a, a paper in law school about the role he played in, in first amendment in, in America yeah. and, and what he, what he did for that, for free speech. And you write about him opening his playboy clubs and having Dick Gregory perform. It was, I think it was the first time that a black comedian was able to perform on his own. Was that the playboy club? It's not the first time, but okay. it is the, is it is the kind of the breakthrough performance because not only does he do great there in front of all white audiences, but he also like, it becomes a story like Esquire picks it up and then time magazine. And then he gets on late night television, which was then very like a great way to get in on a, the tonight show with, with Jack Parr. And so he was, he's considered the Jackie Robinson of stand up because the, up until that point, most of the black comedians were segregated into something called the Chitlin circuit. And Chitlin means fried pork intestines, believe it or not. The people ate. People ate that. And so he, uh, so this Chitlin circuit was this separate but not equal <laughs> circuit. The black comedian, Red Fox was on it, Flip Wilson was on it, uh, Slappy White was on it, Timmy. Uh, what am I, why am I blanking on his name? I'll think of it in a second. And then, uh, so all these Nipsey Russell was on it. And then, so until Dick Gregory, a lot of the nightclubs, remember you talked about, just talked about the nightclub, wouldn't really book comedians unless maybe they booked like a black singer, like Dinah Washington, then they'd have maybe a black comedian open for her or something like that. But that all changed with Dick Gregory. I love that you bring up Hugh Hefner. Because don't forget, in my opinion, Hugh Hefner had a, a, another agenda, which was to sort of legitimize his magazine. So, because uh, a lot of people were just like, we don't want this smutty, fucking, you know, titty pictures and stuff in our uh, neighborhoods and stuff like that. And his point was like, oh, well, now you have free speech in books. And now you're you're getting free speech, not in American movies, but certainly in foreign movies. You could see this. And this is part of humanity. And then there's comedians. Obviously, after Dick Gregory, he really supports Lenny Bruce in a big way. Um, uh, his Lenny Bruce's biography is serialized in Playboy magazine. I'm sure you wrote about that in your your term paper. And so, but his underlying thing was like, I want to maybe make and he he did it <laughs> i don't know what to say he did it he i want to make like these nudie magazines legitimate and that's why he has you know like arthur miller writing for him and, and ayn rand like had a famous essay in playboy and who did ayn rand yeah and yeah 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 so it's like so he was trying to elevate all of that he also was you know big into jazz so he had i always feel like he had a double agenda of like Oh, these guys are pushing the envelope as far as what's acceptable language. Let's, if I can help elevate them, it'll help elevate this whole movement. Right. Cut to now, twelve-year-olds can watch pornography. <laughs> Thank you, you. Well, it's, I, like I, I, I almost saw like it's almost like what Joe Rogan does with his podcast, where well, he'll have on Joey Diaz and these dirty comics, but he'll also yeah. have on professors, and it's like yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It doesn't have to be just one thing, and and it, it's easy to to boil Hugh Hefner down to naked magazines, but uh, yeah, he was he was an interesting guy in terms of uh, how he pushed culture forward outside. No of No question, no question, no question. There, there's a an image of the comedy club today where it's the brick wall, it's the microphone and it's the stool. So you, the microphone makes sense. Everyone gets why there's a microphone up there. The brick wall you explain in the book was just because one of the first comedy clubs, they just couldn't afford to cover right. up the wall, right? That's the improv. Yeah. yeah. But there was a brick wall in a, these little coffee house clubs, uh, niche nightclubs. There was one called the hungry eye in New York. Then they, they had a brick wall also before the improv, but yes, I would say it's because of the improv that that's, the trope of it. And the stool, I've always wondered because 
for, most most comics don't use the stool. You know, you're standing your your whole set. Uh, and th- sometimes every once in a while they'll use it as as a prop, but that's kind of seen as hacky. Most most comics don't really use the stool even as a prop. So why why uh, I'm sorry if you use the stool in your in your in your act. I but- only do stool material. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I just think I pretend I'm a captain of a boat. I, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I that is a good question. Like when was the first stool on stage? Because there was a vaudeville comic who used to sit down named Charlie Case, but he shat, sat, shat, he sat on a chair and, but I do know your buddy, uh, Dick Gregory, who we were just talking about, he would sit down on that stool. So it might've been him because he, he came and then Shelly Berman sat on the stool. I don't think any of the uh, vaudeville, vaudeville guys. So it might be, that's a great question. Maybe when I, re- cause I'm going to revise and update my book in a couple of years. Because so much has happened since yeah. I pre- this thing. I'll look pre- for my name in the acknowledgments. Yes, of course. <laughs> and yeah, I'm wondering like what? Who was the first comedian? And what? Like wh- even why specifically a stool? Like like it could have been. Well, I think it's of- because this is my guess. It's yeah. because of nightclubs, and sometimes singers would like let's let me do a ballad, and they'd sit on a stool yeah. as opposed to stand right with a microphone like that's my guess yeah so they they were up there already for the singer to be like oh and then they change the lighting and then there's just a pin spot and next thing you're you know you're singing uh, my funny valentine or something and that, that's my guess i'll yeah. lay i'll lay I'll, you know i'm friends with another comic historian named cliff nesteroff he wrote a great book yeah, yeah. So he's. I'll. I'll. I'll ask him. But that's my guess. Okay. Good one. Good. Yes, one. You're welcome. Good question, Eric. No one's <laughs> asked me that. I try. Uh, you, you also write about there's there was a a, a, mo- a moment in history that I I didn't know until I read this in your book is that like Richard Pryor. I, I think maybe I'd read about it at some point, but I, I didn't remember it. Richard Pryor put out his special actually in movie theaters, and then Eddie Murphy also did it. Why and and they were huge successes. Why do you think that didn't continue as a, as a medium for putting out specials? Because I, I it must well, have been a short period you're of time. Calling them this is yes. All right, let's just call them specials. That's uh, uh, yes, yeah. Um, well, it has continued. What did we um, up until a few years ago? Um, Kevin Hart was putting out his movies oh, in special oh, in theaters. It was a theatrical thing. That's right. It played mainly in the urban communities is the way I would describe it. But he had some success doing that. Uh, when you were in 2000, right in your sweet spot, there was a huge successful movie called The Original Kings of Comedy. Yes. Did you see that in the theater? I, I'm not, I, I was too young when it first came out, but I, I did see it when I, when I got a little older. It's one of my okay, favorites. Okay, so yeah. that had a theatrical release. Yeah. But I think for the most part, because it's sort of a niche thing and it's really hard to do a great one of those that they, they they just do better once on HBO and then especially on streaming where you can see it whenever, whenever you want to. Yeah. So, but, uh, but Pryor's 1979 live in concert film is, I mean, I, again, I'm biased, but I think it's the best stand up special ever. And I was just listening to an interview with Eddie Murphy about it. He he was concurring like that is just remarkable what happened. And it got great reviews from film critics. These are people who are used to watching, you know, Howard Hawks movies and Billy Wilder movies and breaking that and then they're like one guy on stage just performing. And like Pauline Kael loved it. And there was a guy in New York from the Village Voice named Andrew Saris loved it. Said it was one of the most greatest theatrical experiences of his life. Again, again, this is stand-up. This is yeah. just think about, you know, Milton Burl or Jerry Lou. You know, this is suddenly it's elevated to a unbelievable level because of Richard Pryor and that film. I have to ask you about SNL because I mean that played such a huge role in stand up, even though that's it's sketch mm-hmm. comedy. Like what SNL kind of seemed like it came out of out of nowhere. Like it wasn't, it was just Lauren Michaels was kind of not well known and, and the actors weren't that well known, but it became this huge hit pretty quickly. Well, Lauren Michaels had some success. He had okay. won an Emmy Awards producing these. He had written for there was a a show called Laugh In. He was on he was on staff for Laugh In. So that's in the late sixties. 
and and maybe early 70s but by the time he was on it he was part of a comedy team i don't know if you know this i don't go into it in a big thing and but then he produced a couple specials that won emmy awards starring lily tomlin and richard pryor was on one of them and so he was already like a little bit of the golden kid he was in his 20s you know and and then when the slot, the Saturday night slot opened it up, which I talk about in the book yeah. because of Carson. Carson. Yeah. Uh, they luckily went to this kid who had already done great for, you know, for NBC. They had won Emmy okay. Awards and was, he seemed to know the youth culture and there was a youth movement at that time. And so he put the idea for the sketch show, which is not really, there's elements of vaudeville in it, but it's more like a review, like it's the same cast the whole week and then, you know, special people come in, but, uh, you know, to host, to host and say thing and be this, the, the musical guest. So, uh, yes, I mean, that was, so now you had these late night comp like SNL is now doing drug jokes yeah. and very irreverent polit political jokes and a little, although they never used the F word on that show. To this day, it's really interesting. Uh, they do, you know, whatever. They do really like edgy, edgy material. And that opened up a world. And one comedian more than anyone else benefited from the early years. And that was Steve Martin. Yeah. Who hosts five times over two year period in 77 and 78 or 78, 79. And, and becomes the biggest comic we've ever seen. I was just talking to some other comedians about it. He's the first comedian to play like a big arena. He played the Nassau Coliseum, Steve Martin. So even at his biggest, Bill Cosby and stuff, or they weren't playing that kind of thing. Right. And so now when you see Gabriel Iglesias, Iglesias if sell at Dodger Stadium or Chappelle playing Five Nights at the Hollywood Bowl or like that's all from – what Steve Martin created or Sebastian, you know, doing MSG, those four famous yeah. shows at the uh, Madison Square, Square Garden. Garden. Yeah. And Dice also sold out arenas, but Steve Martin was the first. I remember my parents showed me uh, King Tut when I was like 10. And I think that was my first step to like graduating from, from cartoons to, yeah, to, that's funny. I was more mature comedy, but I don't know how mature Steve Martin was in, or how SNL, but that's like one, one of my earliest memories of liking that kind of comedy. Well, like here's an touch. interesting thing for you and your viewers, viewer. Yeah. Both, my, both of my parents watch. Yeah. Okay. So for your parents, you and your parents, <laughs> there's controversy about King Tut. And that? that there was a school that they showed it. This is just, this is a bigger issue that permeates all of stand up. And the teacher got in trouble for showing that clip, thought it was funny. And the kids were like, this is cultural appropriation. This is offensive. This is worse than blackface. I can't believe you think this is appropriate, let alone funny. And I was like, King Tut? Yeah. So that's where we're at. Like people's sensibilities, sensitivities are so heightened now. Right. It, like even that thing that you liked as a kid is now like taboo on certain campuses. Well, and I, I think that goes back to what we were saying let before. That that's why let that sink in, Eric. <laughs> that's why you can't put together these giant productions of comedy because now everything is so precarious that if one person Thank complains you. and then you have to pull this whole movie that you've dumped <laughs> tens of millions of dollars into. Right. Right. One of the other things that I grew up watching was Comedy Central. I, I mean, that was like where I I like kind of learned about stand up and all that. And because it was like I nine eleven, I was like twelve years old on nine eleven, and and my dad rejoined the army and, and was getting sent overseas. So I kind of like that's when I started wanting to understand more about the world. Was was when that happened. And so uh -huh. like I would I would watch the news and it just kind of seemed like bullshit. Like even when I was that age, I was like these these guys sitting there in suits and and not talking like a normal person would talk just seemed weird yep. to me. And then I remember turning on Tough Crowd, and it was just these four comics just dressed in jeans and like t-shirts and whatever. And they were they were talking about the same issues. I mean, they were talking about what was going on in the world, but they yeah. were talking like normal people. And like that almost kind of became my news when I was that age. That's and, amazing. And, and, and which is I don't I don't know if that's good or bad, but there was there again like Comedy Central had such a huge moment of being the place to break a lot of comics, and and 
the the rise and fall of that do you th- did it coincide with the rise of netflix like, do you think First netflix all, hold on hold on i don't think comedy central has fallen oh uh, I, I tell, me, dis- tell me, let me hear, let me hear. I, let me I mean, hear the thesis. Comedy Central, you turn on Comedy Central now and it's it's reruns of The Office. And, and I mean, they're, they don't have anything like what, when, I mean, when I was growing up, the new shows were The Daily Show and- They still so, have The Daily Show right. on that. Okay. But it's still there. It's still running. But but when it was with Jon Stewart and it, it was it, that relevant. was its moment. Yeah. yeah I, I agree with that. I agree South with Park, that. Crank Yankers, um, uh, uh, David <laughs> Tell, Insomniac. Um, I mean, I you could go on. T- you know, I said tough crowd, but but they had they were just coming out with show after show after show, and and they had that's no, where I the know. specials and a were. lot of stand up, yeah. yeah, a lot of specials and premium blend and all of that stuff, right. and yeah. Well, I yes, I agree they don't do as much, but I think they still do specials, right? They still have comics. That I can't this. remember the last time I saw. I they they came out with a Patrice doc uh, like a year yeah. or two ago that was excellent. That was the first time I've seen something new on Comedy Central in in okay. years. It might have been that you aged out of Comedy Central because think Comedy Central tends to like they're like teenagers and young t- you know young college kids is like their demo. So you might have. I hate uh, to say it. You might age. <laughs> you're 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 telling me I'm old. Uh, that's what no. I'm, I'm just saying it's I'm like because if I you say feel, so, I feel like didn't Taylor Tomlinson do a special? For no, that? she hers. She was on Netflix. The new one is all right. I I know Jesselnick had a show on there. I know years uh, ago the Jesselnick Offensive. That no, was one, there's a newer one that is there a new one on, where he interviews comics. Yeah, okay. not the Jesselnick. <laughs> okay, I love that you know that. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yes, it's not quite the force it was. But yeah. don't forget, it's competing against you know, it's on cable. Like a lot of people don't even have cable. Like, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't. I mean, Comedy Central. I write about it in the book. Was to me an example of corporate America saying, "What is going on with comedy?" Right. Like, what is happening? Because you saw, you were, it. It launches basically eighty nine ninety. Is basically, and it's it's a long story, but. Two of them, and they merged, and uh, so that's why a lot of times when you see there's another station called Ha, and they eventually merge with Comedy Channel, and it becomes Comedy Central. But what's interesting, a lot of times when you see productions, it says, um, oh, "What does it say?" Oh, it's like two productions, or um, oh, I just blanked on that. So anyway, but they they still, it's still like that thing, the two. What is it? Fuck. All right. Uh, yeah. And, but anyway, so that was the start of it. And then by the time you caught it, like tough, yeah, it was like killing. Yeah. And it man was like show. a real farm. Show. I thought it was a real farm system. You would do like a five minute thing and then, a, you know, half hour. And then if you did better than that, you get your own hour. And that's how Amy Schumer, did, Amy Schumer did that with her show. And yeah. So it's, wait, what was um, Key and Peel on? Uh, Comedy Central. That was yeah. That was a little later. That still was was a decade ago. But but yeah yeah yeah. Keen Peel was Comedy Central. Right right. Uh, oh, All right. I, Park, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry for shitting on Comedy Central. No I, no no. <laughs> I love here. I love. There's no. Okay. Stop apologizing. <laughs> it was called Comedy Part. Comedy Part. Comedy Partners. That's what it's called. Okay. So we, when you ever you see like the, the at the end of their productions, comedy that means Ha and Comedy Central. They still use the oh interesting. Partners. Okay, little, I didn't realize that. Little business, little business. Yeah, no, I, I like I like the inside baseball, like I said. But uh, yeah, but, and also, I feel like they also still do the roasts, right? Yeah, the roasts. Were Although huge. I noticed that um, Netflix has a roast coming up. Oh, really? I didn't see that. Yes, interesting. Yeah, they're doing a roast of like, I mean, the Jonas brother, one of those brothers. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, yeah, know. yeah. right. We're, I'm too old now. I don't. I don't care about. Yeah, this. you don't care about this. <laughs> you just want to turn on uh, uh, super bad and remember. That's right. Feet. Reminisce exactly. <laughs> uh, so the reason why I brought up Comedy Central was because I think to me that was the last big thing before the internet. Like the internet was took over comedy once the internet got big. So it was uh-huh. you know Dane Cook. I remember I was friends with Dane Cook on MySpace when I was 13 and. Uh, you were. Oh, that's yeah. incredible. I, I, How did I, that work? Because so, so what I, year is that? What that year was is like two thousand three or four. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's right. Um, I 
like and that, that like that was my first time like discovering someone myself and telling my friends about so like i felt so cool that i was like you got to check this guy out like so he had a myspace profile yep and like myspace was mostly like like you could have your profile and then it was mostly bands were like the professional profile so you could follow bands but i think dane was the first big non oh, yeah right about it. no he's a pioneer there's yeah. no question about it but what was in other words did you email him did you like no chat with him yes you? you could i chatted with you could because he would he would just chat with individual fans yep, and so i, I remember know. doing that like like you would i, I forget exactly how the process worked because this was this was a long time ago now but it's like you could add just like you on facebook you could add someone as a friend yeah yeah and then you could private message with them and i think i just you know i was 13 i just sent him a message it's like hey I, I thought that was funny and and he would send something back to say hey thanks like you know it's just like a little bit back and forth but you're like oh this you know this comedian this, no, this guy is on tv's messaging me no i've spoke to him he said he spent hours and hours connecting with fans yeah and again he became huge partially because of that and he also had that comedy and old uh, uh his half hour was extremely popular then the record you know he hosted snl twice yeah like he was big, multiple huge. movies multiple hbo specials um yeah so what well, and and, and he he was the first one I saw, you know, who could sell out. A re like, I remember going to see a show at, at it was called the Igloos where the Pittsburgh Penguins played. Yep. And, you know, you, you, you'd go to a hockey game and there's these two, you know, hundred million dollar franchises with 30 players and, and all of their, all of their people. And they couldn't sell out that arena. And then I'm going and I'm seeing this one guy standing there in front of this packed or like, that was wild to me when I first saw that, that someone yeah. could do that. Yeah, was he? Did he do it in the round? He did in the round? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The okay, whole, yeah. the whole. I think they, they might have blocked off like one small part of the arena, but it was basically the whole arena. <laughs> yeah, and, that's and great. That like that. I remember just again. I was young. I was probably fourteen, fifteen, and and it just blew my mind. No question. No, I'm sure there was a lot of cute girls because the girls yeah. loved that guy. Oh, they, they did. Right. Him. Well, that's the problem. Is like they all. They're, yeah, all they want to do is is get Dane to to sign their. <laughs> well, you're there. Maybe them. some spillover or something. <laughs> Trust me, there was not spillover. I don't know. That was, yeah, that's a very historic moment. I write about it in the book. Like yeah. he like was able to parlay that. And then we were off to the races, man. Yeah. We were off to the races in a huge way. And then Bo Burnham comes yeah. along and then, do you know who Angelie Johnson is? Yeah. Angela Johnson. Yeah. I've seen her. Yeah. Angela. Is it Angela? Ange Angela. I've heard it pronounced uh, Angela. Yeah. Angela Johnson. Yeah, yeah. She does the, the nail salon thing. So yep, that was yep. another one of those like, Oh Yeah. Comedians become famous not playing comedy clubs like Wayne Fetterman. Right. They can put something <laughs> just, on just YouTube. Just leapfrog. I'm sure all, yeah, right. Yeah, I'm sure all the club comics. Me. I'm like, what's <laughs> what did I miss? What did I miss? Totally. Totally. Right. Like, what's happening here? And and you you mentioned Louie. Like, and I didn't put this together until I was reading it in the book about how, you know, Louie put his special out on his own site for like five bucks. And, and that just kind of leapfrogged the entire industry and showed, you know, he made a million dollars off of that. And... I, I, I realize like that's kind of predated now the the Patreon era where you see comics. You know, there's a whole a whole platform now dedicated to just fans giving money and comics providing their material. Yep. And and Louis was really the first one to do that before any any of that existed. Where it's just right. Like, we it don't was, need I, Hollywood. I think Louis Louis was like, here's a product, I'll sell it to you. But yeah. a lot of Patreon. Just like, do you like all of my stuff? Send me five bucks a month or something like that. Isn't that the way it sort of? A works? lot of comics will will what they'll do is you know they have their podcast that'll put out like once a week for free, and then they'll say, give me five bucks a month for Patreon, mm -hmm. you'll get a bonus episode a week. So there there is new content that's created uh, just for for Patreon people. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I love it. Uh, and, and I can see someone putting out. I don't no. know if, if Patreon really um can sustain, but uh, I don't know if you could put out a whole hour long special on Patreon, but I could see something like that happening. If, oh, okay, if the, okay, like a podcast. That. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm always fascinated by that because I see it a lot on YouTube, like reactors. Do you know what reactors are? Are, are those the people that like will play a video and then just yeah. talk yeah, about yeah, the video? Yeah, but they have yeah. – like it's all free on YouTube, but they have a Patreon page where apparently they can do this without a, having to worry about you know Led Zeppelin taking down their clip, you know, of right. the song they're, they're reacting to. Right. Interesting. But uh, no, fascinated by that. But no, Louis was, I mean, I know, I know people are upset with him because of that, his personal behavior. But I, to me, there's been no one in the history of stand up that's produced content at that high a level in so many different mediums at the same time. 
Yeah. That he was doing that show and doing those specials, writing, directing, editing, acting in those shows that end. I just feel like there's never been anything like it. I can't, can't even imagine it. As a comic, when you see someone like that, are you just like, I'm never going to be able to do anything like that? Or does it inspire you? Oh, good question. This is the, the way I look at it when I would see Louie or even there was a comedian who didn't do that, but was just like, I just felt like was a bad, way better comedian than me named Greg Giraldo. He used yeah. to be part of uh, Tough Crowd and stuff. But I always look at it like, oh. I'm lucky that I'm in the same business as this guy. That's all I look right. at it. I don't look right. at it like, oh, yeah, I'm not in competition. I do right. my own thing. I'm doing right. fine. But yeah, those guys, it's just like, I love that the whole thing gets elevated. And I think it helps everyone. But I'm real. I'm just like, oh, I get to be part of this. Yeah. I get, you- I get to do a, a, two episodes of Tough Crowd with Greg Giraldo. Yeah. I get to, you know, I just, you know, or do a set and then watch Louie do an hour. Like, what the hell? Yeah. And then talk to him afterwards, like, you know, comic to comic. It's just that, yeah, I think of the world of that. And I know people don't, and I understand that, but Jesus, what a writer, what a performer, man. I've heard a lot of comics, especially like comics who came up in the 80s, talk about how back then there was a competition. Like guys felt like there's only so many slots. Like everyone's trying to get a sitcom and there's only so yeah, many yeah. slots. And so it was more competitive. So do you, do you think like just in general now there's more comics who are like you just like, uh, I, I don't have to be competing against other comics. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I do think, I do think that I, I, I don't want to generalize. There's still hyper competitive comedians that one who would, you know, kick you to the side of the road so they could get an audition to do or a chance to do something. So that's always going to exist. But I do feel like there's a little more of a a healthier view of the whole business of like, oh, I'm uh, like I'm a hustler and I have to do this. And this is, I think, I think, I don't know. Again, you're stumping me with these questions because you <laughs> ask that, these questions. Does that make that me like, a good? Does that make me a good interview no, or a bad one? You, okay. You tend to ask questions that are big, generational. Like, mm-hmm. I don't. I don't even know if I agree that it was more competitive in the '80s. But so, you know, I don't know what the science is behind that. And then I have to like fumble through this answer and make myself sound <laughs> no, smart. No. And then I don't know what I'm talking I, about. To me, I mean, that's just the fun part of history. Is like, you know, you, you say how you know comedy started in the radio and then it moved to TV and and movies, and then now it's back to podcasts, which is basically radio just with new technology. And it's I like seeing those cycles in history. Of course, and- of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, remember we were just talking about like when when Dane and Bo Burnham and Angelie Johnson like leapfrog all this whole generation of comics using the internet and then but it's that had happened in the 50s when records came out and suddenly bob newhart is the biggest star in the country and you know these poor i don't know stanley myron handelman who's ever working at that time is like what the right. I, I was doing it the right way is you know trying to play the cat skills or something right. and it was like oh well guess what a comedian uh, figured out a way to adapt to this new technology. And he wasn't the only one, Shelley Berman and Mort Saul and obviously, you know, even your buddy, Lenny Bruce. I like that. I call him your, he's your friend. I, I'll take that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and even you mentioned the Catskills, like the Catskills now, like for people who even know what the Catskills are, it's, it's like the butt of a joke because it's considered like, that's what the older generation did. And, and at the time it was, that was the place to be. Certainly in the forties and fi- yeah, in the forties and fifties, it was. Yeah. And, but then, you know, Greenwich Village happened. And next thing you know, you have Bill Cosby and Joan Rivers and Richard Pryor and Woody Allen doing little rooms, not big nightclubs. And then, and then obviously we talked about Bud Friedman and the comedy club. So, so so, I don't know. I obviously I wrote a book about it. I think the whole (laughs) story of it's fascinating. Yeah. Was there anything you read in the book you were just like, ah, this doesn't sound right. I know this sounds baloney. Who is this guy? Well, no, the, the, the only thing you've said so far that I've read so far that sounds baloney is, is you saying Comedy Central hasn't fallen because like, you know, no, I, I, I it has fallen from us, but it's still, I think, a, a little bit of a force. But I might be wrong about yeah. that. I might be because it still has the Daily Show and it yeah. does the roast and. But you might be right. You might be right. <laughs> and You're saying it's just 
reruns of sitcoms. I, I, when when I uh, the office when I and again part of it is you're you're right like I don't watch cable TV the way I used to so I, I think mm-hmm. all of cable TV is kind of going through the same thing where it just isn't as relevant as it used to be but yeah. I, I don't they they're there's they're not even close to creating the new kind of shows that they were creating okay. in the early 2000s. as far as new content you're probably right right, right. yeah um, the way the you only- said it was like the rise and fall like it's done like it got canceled or something like the Friars Club the rise right. and fall of the Friars Club right. it's fallen it's over right right it still exists just. Right. It, I, I would say it, it exists worst, as a yes. shell of itself. <laughs> Eric, I'm the worst guest. <laughs> no, no. This, this is now? fun. You don't understand. Like, so many guests I have, it's like, you know, I ask a question, they answer it. I ask a question. They, like, I, I like when you kind of push back. Uh, no, this is this is way more fun. All right. Um, I'm trying to think of another bullshit. The only uh, – when I was reading the book, I we talked about we I, my buddy Lenny Bruce. Like, I was surprised how little there was of Lenny Bruce because, I, you know, I had – again uh, – just from my law background and Lenny's role in, in free speech, like I've, I think I've always built him up as someone big. And I had on Ron Collins and David Scover who wrote the big thing, a huge book on Lenny Bruce, and, and they got yeah. him pardoned. So in, in my head, Lenny Bruce is is the godfather of, of comedy. So, OK, I could see that. I mean, he certainly was confessional and pushed the boundaries of, of satire. No question. No yeah. question. I mean, no question. And I really feel like the guy on um, – um, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel does the best Lenny Bruce I've ever seen. Yeah, it's good. Way better than Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. I've only seen clips, clip, clips of that guy Cliff Gorman who did it on Broadway, and you can see a little of him in that movie, um, uh, all that jazz. Okay. But it's, uh, yeah, he's incredible. He really gets like why that guy was funny and weird yeah. and you know. Jazzy and all. Right. I, I love. I, I don't. I wish I knew that actor's name, but yeah. If you're listening, kudos, I'll, man. I'll, I'll add. I'll, I'll find yeah. it. Add the link to it for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That guy's. No, here's the interesting thing because I again there probably could be more Lenny Bruce in my book, but uh, this is interesting. You know, he he only gets arrested in big liberal cities like that. Right. Always interests me. Like why San Francisco, yeah. Chicago, New York, and L.A. And then. A lot of people think it's because he went after the church. Like that was his. Labor that's Ron Collins or David Scover. That's that's kind of their their thesis. That's his theory also. Okay. He got, okay. You know he got he he got arrested on paper for saying cocksucker and, and words he wasn't supposed to say. But Ron Collins and David Scover say it was really because he was going after the church, especially as a Jew. Yes. Yes. So again, I wasn't there, so those guys are way more knowledgeable. But that's what they say. That's what I keep repeating. Uh, but. What's interesting, like this was a huge, simple, civil, like this is a simple civil rights case. Like it's like it's a free speech thing. It's like it's a private night. No one's complaining about him. It's just the cops don't want it in this neighborhood because they don't like the. Guess who's not on Lenny Bruce's team, legal team? Who? ACLU. Right. A. C L U. It's really interesting why they distanced from that guy. I don't remember that part of the story. Well, that's- Eric. Well, that's why you're talking to Wayne Trevor. <laughs> do you, Do you know Do you know more behind why? No, no. That's I would int- love I have to, to know. look I into love- that. Yeah, look into that. Yeah, because I've read some quotes like, "Where was the ACL?" You're like, yeah. Because yeah, I mean, they were they were I mean, they were around from the early 1900s. They were certainly active. Yeah. Huh. That's a good question. Wow, I don't know. You're this feels like that would be up that that should be right up my that's that's what my somebody book somebody who's into you, comedy and law uh, and yeah like this, you've given this, me this would be your thing you've given me a book to write now uh, yeah so <laughs> yeah where was the ACLU I love that that's that's fascinating I'm I'm, I'm gonna or, look into that the way I would write it would be where the fuck was the ACLU? yeah right that's the way of course yeah, of course. yeah right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, I'm at least yeah. ah, I'm looking into that for sure. I gotta I gotta pull up the the Lenny Bruce book to see. I don't I don't remember Ron and David talking about the ACLU. That's interesting. So okay, so we'll we'll end with this. You're working on the George Carlin American Dream special for yes, HBO. Yeah. Tell me about that. Ah, uh, well, no, just I had worked on the Gary Shanley documentary that Judd had also directed. This is a good Judd co-directs this with a gentleman by the name of Mike Bonfiglio and who, by the way, directed that um, Patrice documentary that okay. you love so much. Yeah, so he's excellent. great. He's just great. So there's a lot of firepower 
in this. And I just helped out through the all during the pandemic. And I was just, I, I don't know what to say. Just thrilled to be part of it, let alone get any credit for it. Like, yeah. it's Carly that I just put on my Mount Rushmore. And I, I don't agree with everything George Carlin said, by the way. I'm not one of those like, oh, American dream sucks. Like, right. I don't even agree with that. But his use of language, his the way he crafted comedy was just beyond inspiring for me the whole way through, the whole way yeah. through. So, um, you know, from the like, straight guy doing hippy-dippy weatherman <laughs> and all of that stuff. Through, the, through him becoming the hippie and the seven right. dirty words to becoming the cantankerous, sometimes, you know, very belligerent old man screaming at people. I I, I love the whole thing. So it's, it's, it comes out on HBO. If you like Carlin, I don't know if you do, but. I love, uh, you, you ask me personally, I, I think he's a legend. Absolutely. And I, I'm with you. I mean, that's, I don't agree with everything anyone. I don't agree with everything I say. And that's to me, like, that's what I love about what? comedy and, and what I love about, I'll, I'm sure I said something yesterday that I'm like, ah, I don't know about that. Uh, right, but, right, right. But, um, like what I love about it is just, is having people having the freedom to say what's on their mind and seeing what kind of reaction they get. And that was, was Carlin. And he wasn't even, you know, I, I had his daughter on the podcast a while ago. Oh, you did? Kelly. Yeah. Kelly, yeah. 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 And she was great. And, and, you know, you're talking about Louis C.K. and talking about what, what comics do in their personal life. And Carlin, Carlin was a loving father, but he wasn't, he wasn't like this great present guy all the time in her life. But to me, it's like, I, I judge him based on his, his art and what he created and what he did to push so much of, of the language and of culture forward. I mean, the seven dirty words, again, that was a Supreme court case. I mean, that changed that, 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 that FCC versus Pacifica, which was about Carlin's seven dirty words was just yeah. cited last year in a Supreme court case about yeah. free speech. And, and uh, it was, a, it was a, a high school cheerleader was, was making fun of her school over text. And they cited the FCC versus Pacifica Carlin's case in that Supreme court case. So it's just, I, there's, there's history, there's culture, there's, so I'm I'm so excited to see this documentary. I think Carlin's just such an important figure in all well, of this. Well, I, 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 fingers crossed. I think you're gonna love it. Like sure it, what the, you'll you'll. I think you're gonna love it because awesome. it is loaded with stuff that I had never seen. It's just incredible. That's awesome. And and so that's coming out April twentieth or, or May twentieth right. on HBO. Uh, Wayne, is there any anywhere else you want people to look you up? The book again is the history of stand up. It's again fantastic. It's a quick, easy read, but it's, it's a quick read, filled, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I it's one hundred and thirty pages, but it's just filled with with just fascinating stories. Thank you, thank you. I uh, almost the way I look at it is almost every page of that book, any page could be a book in yeah. itself. Just any page, and there's been books written about a lot of those things. Yeah. So, but I wanted people just to be able to digest the whole thing without getting bogged down into, right. you know, the origin of the Catskill mountains or right. you know, any of that stuff. Right. And you, so. you list your sources of people, what, if they want to dive into it, they can. And yeah, I have yeah. to, we mentioned Greg Giraldo, my friend, Matt Balaker wrote a book on Greg Giraldo. Uh, yeah. And so there's, yeah, like you, you can dive into all this stuff so deeply and, and maybe there's a hole in Lenny Bruce's relationship with the ACLU that I need to write something on and, We'll, we'll see how that goes. But Wayne Fetterman, thank you so much. I really appreciate you. You're, you're very welcome. You're very welcome.